Hello, students of Blackman High School. Um, I am Mr. Seedorf here, Brian Seedorf, one of the librarians here at Blackman High School. And for our next installment of our Blackman High School, a conversation with, I have a Blackman High alumnus, Ms. M. Tara Crowell. She is the author of middle grade novels, Eden's Wish and Eden's Escape, published by Disney Hyperion. She's a native of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and she received a BA in Cinematic Arts from the University of Southern California and an MA in Creative Writing from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Tara splits her time between New York City and her family's farm in the Northern Catskills. Please welcome Ms. M. Tara Crowell. Happy to be here. Thank you. From a young age, uh, you've said previously in interviews, you were reading. Um, you said before that you would run into things because you had a book in front of your nose. You love A Wrinkle in Time. You love Rule Doll. How did reading at a young age set the tone for your creative life in the years to come? Um, yeah, it's true. I, I read so much when I was a kid. My dad actually worked at Ingram Book Company, so he would get lots of um, kind of free books at work, and he would bring them home, and I just read all of them. I'd read through boxes of books, and then I'd read them over and over and over. I, um, you know, I think when I was a kid, um, reading, it, it just shaped the way that I saw the world, which um was great because through books the world can become so much bigger than the world that you see right in front of you so i think that by reading so many books i was really able to imagine beyond beyond what i saw in my day-to-day -day life and um and i think books really just became like a safe um happy comfortable place for me where i could always go back to and i still always go back to and um, they make me as happy today as they did then. And what was your favorite roll doll? My favorite roll doll? Oh, it's tough. <laughs> um, I love Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I love Matilda. I love James <laughs> the Giant <Chinese. laughs> um, I actually love like everything that Roald Dahl has written, including all of his adult stuff. Um, I think I've read most of it. His short stories. There's like a BBC series that's based on his short stories, which is amazing. Um, he wrote a James Bond movie. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> no. um, interesting. But yeah, so I, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to choose. <laughs> You're quite the super fan. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, big fan. So you grew up in Murfreesboro. You went to high school here at Blackman High, home yeah. of the place. And I have a list of things here that you were involved with, and it's a rather um, lengthy list. So let me go through those. Uh, Key Club, Renaissance, Student Council, Blackman Voice, the school newspaper, National Honor Society, Swim Team, you were even voted most likely to succeed in the senior superlatives. So throughout this time, you wanted to be a writer, but, you hit a turning point. You were in the school's radio and TV class. You said that it, you hit a moment, not a moment, but you decided to go into film. What was it about film or, or in the high school class that made you want to shift your journey? Um, I, think, I think when I was in high school, I, it was probably toward the beginning of high school. I just became really, um, really interested in movies and how they tell stories. And, um, and I started to <clears throat> just wa watch movies that had different structures and movies that were a little more experimental. And I just loved what could be done with that form of storytelling. And then when I was in um, Coach Max class, we, I, I started, I, I was doing the stuff for BSPN. So that was, um, you know, I would be going out and, sh and shooting my stories and editing them. And then I started making some 
short films just for fun with my friends. And then I started making these like movies at home with all this footage that I, I just started like filming my friends all the time. And then I put them together into these um, DVDs, which are crazy, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I just, um, I just loved like the form of film and I, I became really interested in that and, you know, kind of smitten by it. And so I decided that that was what I wanted to study. And I thought, you know, start my career in. Absolutely. Any other uh, teachers that you remember, you mentioned coach uh, John McCreary or any other teachers that stand out to you, you can remember? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I loved my, um, I loved the history classes that I took. Um, what, I remember I had European history with Coach Green. I don't know if he's still there. Um, that in my American history class, I really loved. Um, I loved, I actually loved math when I was in school as well. Um, so yeah, my teachers, my math teachers are not as quite as vivid in my memory, but, um, but I really loved math and physics when I was in school too. Absolutely. Any specific, is there any memory about being here at Blackman High that whether with just friends or whatever that really stands out to you? Um, a lot of, a lot of memories with my friends. Yeah, I had, I was really fortunate to make really, really close friends, um, when I was in high school who are still my best friends. And, um, so I think, you know, that, that can be pretty unique and pretty rare. Um, and I'm really grateful for it. It's, yeah, it's hard to remember one specific memory. We, um, you know, we, I mean, I guess we, we kind of would get in trouble for some of this stuff sometimes, but we like make matching t-shirts all the time. We kind of go on these, you know, we kind of get on these like platforms sometimes where we, we were like, you know, kind of like being vocal about one issue or another. And we'd like, you know, kind of make matching t-shirts and be really defiant about it. But, um, but yeah, we were, we had a great time and they they were really good friends and still are. I, I noticed in your freshman year, you really joined a lot of clubs. I mean, you, it, and, and even on up through the end, um, where you were very involved, was that, a, was that something you had planned to do? Or was that something that really organically happened? If I'm going to join that. I'm going to join that. Uh, I think it happened organically. You know, I, I was very, um, I think I was very focused. I, I was always focused on doing well in school. And I knew that there were all these opportunities in high school to get involved in different things. And so I think, um, you know, I just kind of figured like, well, I may as well join this. I may as well do this too. And, um, and I don't think it ever felt overwhelming um, that I remember. I, I, think, I think it was good and it enriched my experience. Did you work anywhere in high school? Yeah, I worked at Baskin Robbins. Um, I guess it was like, it was like the summer after my junior year and my senior year, I think. Yeah. Your forearm must have been just ripped. It was, yeah, and it always had the sticky lines <laughs> on it from the tubs. <laughs> Absolutely. You took a chance, a big chance, um, from what I could read. you chased the dream and you decided to move across the country to attend the University of Southern California for your cinematic arts degree. So I wanna talk college a little bit. I've got some seniors who went within five or six months, they're out. Mm -hmm. That is very real to them. What was your favorite class in college? Uh, I had a lot of classes that I loved in college, actually. I loved my major. Um, so cinematic arts, well, I'm not sure how they do it now, but at the time when I was at USC, it was kind of divided into three 
subcategories. So there was critical studies, which was what I did, which was sort of like the like the academic study of film, like sort of like if you took English, lit, how you'd be how you'd be reading books. Um, so yeah, we'd have a lecture, watch a movie, and then write papers about them um, in discussion sections. And then there was a production track, um, you know, for people who want to actually like be on set, uh, be directing or cinematography or lighting or something like that. And then there was screenwriting. So I did critical studies. So some of my classes were, and, and USC has really an incredible film program and the instructors were all amazing. Probably my favorite classes were, I actually took a course on James Bond. Um, and then I did one um, that was all Hitchcock, all Alfred Hitchcock's films. And that really, that really influenced and shaped how I saw storytelling in general. Um, and then I also took a couple classes just for fun that I really loved. Like I took a class on classic rock through the music school. I took a class on the Beatles. So I, I took a lot of classes that I loved. Who is the James Bond? John Connery. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a favorite Bond film? I, you know, I really like Dr. No, which is the first one. There, I, there are a lot that I like, but that one kind of always stuck with me. I really loved it. What was your toughest class? My toughest class was probably, I, so be, even though I was on the critical studies track, I had to take one, like every, every film student had to take one kind of introduction to production class. And that was probably my hardest class. You make five short films in the semester. So you have one week to for pre-production, one week to shoot and one week to edit. And then you show it to the class and everyone gives feedback and you get a grade for it. You do that five times during the semester. It's nonstop. And I had not made any film since high school and it was just not on the same level and I had like the real camera, you know, and the real equipment. And there are people in my class who already knew, you know, how to light a set and how to do special effects and all this stuff. And I was like, whoo, anyway, that was really hard, but it was really, really good too. Um, I learned a lot, including I learned that I did not want to be in production, <laughs> but it was good. It was a great experience, but yeah, I would say that was the hardest. So what is something about post high school that there is no way that high school could prepare you for? You know, there's certain things that teachers can tell you, but then there's some things you just have to learn on your own once you're out of high school. What is something that you had to learn on your own, especially moving across the country? I found college to be a lot more work than high school was. It required a lot more time and commitment. And, um, you know, I couldn't, I, I was used to being able to skate, kind of skate through a lot of things, um, you know, and kind of like finish my homework in homeroom or whatever. So I think I had to, I had to learn how to study in a way that I hadn't before. I had to learn how to like read a lot of pages of text um, in a short time, which I hadn't had to do before. And uh, yeah, just just work harder. If you're if you're in a position where you can skate through things and get good grades, it's it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't carry over into the real world, really. No. So. So, yeah, that's something that I learned um, that I think I didn't really understand before I got to college. After college, you stayed in California and you went to work in Hollywood. You by reading and helping to develop screenplays. Uh, I read that you worked with an independent movie, independent movie producer, literary manager. You again were chasing the dream and you said that you loved shaping scripts to stories. But I 
to know how did making connections during this time in California affect your opportunities? Because I, I think connections are very important. So I, um, I did a couple of internships when I was an undergrad at production companies. And I ended up working, so, someone who worked at the first production company where I interned, um, he ended up being my first boss. And when I graduated, I didn't, you know, I, I was in the process of interviewing, but I didn't know where I was gonna work. And so I was interviewing at all these different places. And I walked into this, you know, this um, office and I didn't even know he had left that place and started this other company, but he remembered me from when I had interned. So, and then he hired me because he remembered, you know, that I had, I had been a good intern, I guess. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, that's just one example, but it really is, it really is everything. So I would say, if you want to go into that industry, I would definitely encourage you to, um, to intern when you're an undergrad and, you know, if you're not going to go to college in LA or New York, maybe you can go for a summer for an internship because, um, that's really an opportunity to, meet people, start to make connections, learn a lot, and um, just kind of like, you know, get your foot in the door when you, it's not crunch time and you're trying to find a real job that's going to pay you enough to live. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it really was, I, I think what I, I really like about, well, not a theme of your life, but it seemed like there may have been fear sometimes, but you really did take risks. You really did take chances. You really did say, I'm going to go for it. It's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. But I think, you know, sometimes you get to a point where, um, I guess the fear of not pursuing something overrides the fear of doing the thing. You know, I, I'm afraid of regretting not not trying something so that becomes scarier than doing the thing sometimes Absolutely, yes you keep saying you were chasing that dream but you it sounds like when you were there in california you did hit a moment that deep down you realized that dream of you being a writer was still there it sounds like it was still back here and it was bugging you so you, you took a chance and you decided to move to Sydney, Australia to obtain a master's degree in writing from, help me again with the title. <laughs> Macquarie. Macquarie. Macquarie, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> what did you learn about yourself from that creative writing program? Uh, well, that, I mean, I would say, you know, talking about taking risks, that was the biggest risk I think I've taken because I mean, as you said, it's exactly right. I was, I, I really, I thought that I wanted to work in Hollywood and I, there was a lot that I loved about it. But once I got there and especially once I got to my second job, which was um, a step up from my first job and it was going really well. And it kind of was because things were going so well, it made me think like, oh, this, this just doesn't feel quite like what is in my heart, as cheesy as that sounds. I just, I did have that nagging um, in the back of my mind through it all that like, and I think I'd realized it kind of, I'd come to terms with it a couple of years before sort of, but I kind of kept pushing it back, you know, that I, that I wanted to still write books because I was like, no, 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 that's not realistic. And also you're doing this now and you're doing well, you have to stay on this track. and. And then I finally just realized, you know, I, I was only a couple of years into working in Hollywood, but I just realized like, you know, I could go for it now, or I could like go for it in 10 years after my career is further along, or I could never go for it. So if I'm going to try, maybe I should just go ahead and do it now when I'm still young and I don't have a family to support and I don't have any you know, strings to tie me down. So 
it sat, it seemed a little bit crazy though. Like when I, when I told people, they actually thought like, oh, okay, that's, that's kind of out of left field because yeah, I think, you know, it seemed like I was, I was doing well in my job and I was on a good, um, good trajectory, but yeah, it just, I just had a nagging feeling that, and I, and I just kind of thought like, even if I got to the top, on this track that I'm on, I'm not sure that I would be happy or satisfied there. I think there's something else that I that I want. And so, um, yeah, so I made that call and I, th I decided to go to Australia kind of, I think just because um, I knew I needed to do something entirely new. I, you know, I certainly wasn't gonna just quit my job in LA and say, I'm writing now. <laughs> And, um, and I looked at, you know, different programs and then I saw that there was this one in Australia and I had never thought about going to Australia before. I didn't know anyone there. I'd never been there, but I just decided that I just said, that's it. That's what I'm doing. So, um, yeah. And even in the midst of all of that, I was, you know, sometimes I was like, what am I doing again? <laughs> Why am I doing this? It, it felt weird. But, um, but once I got there, it just opened my eyes, opened my world in a new way that, that had never, I'd never experienced before. Just like, I felt like I'd been going along like this and then it just opened up like this. It just, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. I just, it was like, I just saw a different dimension to life and what it can be. And I think I allowed myself to see it, whereas like before I'd been pretty, um, you know, goal oriented and always like looking to the next step. And so I just kind of allowed myself to look around and experience something new. And yeah, and it changed me completely. I think like I underwent an enormous change during that move. And I wouldn't say it was, I mean, the program was good, but it wasn't necessarily you know, just the program itself. It was just the whole, the whole change and, and taking that risk and just doing something that was unexpected and that I didn't think I was going to do and to realize, wow, there's so much more out there that, that I didn't, that I still, even after having moved across the country, I just had no idea there was still so much more. And this is only like a tiny little piece of it. You know, I thought about that too, of you started to have a lot of uh, situations in your life after you moved from here in Murfreesboro, when you moved to LA, when you moved to Australia, there's only you, there's no one you can really rely on that's next to you. It's you, those decisions are you. And I think that's a big slap in the face for some students also when they get out. Sometimes you're the only one that can make a call. You had those moments too. Yeah, I still do. And that's why I think like it's important to come to terms with what what really are those like things in the back of your mind, those like dreams and desires that you have and like look them in the face and just say like, okay, this is actually what I really want. And maybe, you know, success might not look for me, like it would for other people or like I expected that it might, but this is, um, this is the thing for me. And this is what is gonna give me, like pursuing this, putting my heart into this is what's gonna give me peace, regardless of whether I succeed or fail. And that was kind of, that was kind of how I felt. And it, cause at the end of the day, yeah, you have, you live, <laughs> you live in your body, you have your brain and, um, you know, you like have relationships with other people, but at the end of the day, you go to sleep with yourself, you wake up with yourself and you have to, you have to try to make that, make the most of that, I think. So we're about to get to these right here. <laughs> While in Sydney, you started writing what would become your first book, Eden's Wish. But before I get to that, I was really fascinated by this part. You moved to New York City where you finished it, but in the meantime, you started working a lot of different jobs. You did catering jobs, you did temp jobs and offices, you did tutoring jobs. Now that 
to me takes a lot of willpower or survival or really to me is work ethic. How did your work ethic during that time help you through what would potentially be just, it could be a catastrophic time of finding yourself? Because first of all, I never, I never thought I was going to move to New York. I kind of thought I would move back to LA after a year in Sydney. And then after that year, I was like, I don't know, that doesn't, that doesn't feel right. And I, and I felt like I wanted to do something brand new. And so I guess, you know, I decided to move to the most expensive city in America. So I had, I had to work my butt off a little bit and you, cause you can't just sit around and write a book, um, you know, when nobody's paying you for it. In New York, especially, yeah, you have to, you have to keep working, keep moving. Um, and I think, you know, for me, when I moved to New York, if I, if I work a job like I did before, um, when I was in LA, you know, a job in entertainment, which I, which I, you know, probably could have done, but I just felt like that was going to consume my energy. Um, and I was not going to have enough left to really give everything to finishing this book, which was what I wanted to do. So I decided that I wanted to do jobs that would give me, that would basically keep me on my toes, keep me moving all around the city, um, keep me meeting new people, having new experiences. And it actually like provided such a wealth of, of um, experience. And I don't know, not, I don't want to say material, but it, it did, you know, like just being able to be a part of the city in those different ways, working as a temp in different offices, tutoring for kids, like, working in catering at all these different parties all in all different parts of the city. And it also, you know, it was hard. So it also did keep me motivated to keep writing that book and, make, and making it as good as it could possibly be so I could sell it and like take a step back a little bit. That's, I mean, sacrifice, it sounds yeah. like, but to, for something you really loved and wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. What, what was the hardest job out of all those, those temp jobs? The, well, I guess the cater waitering get, it, it depended, it totally depended on the party, but sometimes, sometimes some of the, some of those parties, the people just, <laughs> you just want the night to be over. I think everyone, in my opinion, everyone needs to work in food at least once of yeah, something to know what, so yep. to know what that's really like. With your first book, it's Eden's Wish, you had to finish a draft, find an agent, more revisions, take to the publishers, and then it was sold to Disney Hyperion in a two book, two book deal that eventually inc included Eden's Escape. And both of these are middle grade novels. I'm gonna actually let you take a moment to describe these books, this world for uh, the students here. So Eden's Wish is about a 12 year old genie named Eden. And she lives in a lamp with her masters who are kind of like her mom and dad. And she lives like a princess, but um, all she wants is to be a regular girl and have freedom. She's been to earth to grant wishes, but she can only go for as long as it takes for whoever has rubbed the lamp to make their three wishes. And then she gets sucked back in the lamp. But whenever she's there, all she wants to do is run around, swim in the ocean, go on adventures. She's from a long line of genies that's gone back for thousands of years. And her masters tell her that she's the first genie who's ever, who's ever been like this. So she finds a way to escape the lamp and comes to earth and it's all about her adventures on earth. She gets caught up in the power struggle between um, the genie alumni who, are, who live on earth now and are immortal and are loyal to the lamp and its masters and then these other genie alumni who um, have formed this organization that's like opposed to alumni and they're trying to get the lamp's power for themselves so she gets caught in the middle of that so then in eden's escape she is allowed to go and live on earth um, under the care of a guardian, but she's still a genie, so she can still be summoned for wishes. So it's the first time that this has ever happened. So she ends up in New York. Um, she's under the care of a genie alum named Pepper. 
She then gets summoned to Paris for a granting and then she gets caught up in a whole, whole other adventure there. And for the students here, they are right here. Mm -hmm. By the way, are in our, they're displayed in our Blackman High School Hall of Fame in the library. So nice. yeah, they're right up there. So Eden's Wish, I, I noticed the theme of this, Eden's Wish is set in California, correct? Um, yeah. Where you went to college and worked. Eden's Escape is set in Paris, where you visited to research and write, and then it's back in New York. And But I noticed travel. Travel has made a big impact on your life. And I think, um, I'd like to reiterate again that Murfreesboro, Tennessee kid to California, to Australia, to New York. And sometimes kids think I can never leave if I don't want to. What advice about traveling and seeing the world would you give to students? You can't overestimate its value like the most, the most valuable, wonderful thing that you can do. And um, it's not, it, it's not, I know it can seem daunting, but it's, it's not really, and it doesn't have to be that expensive. Um, you can find ways to do it affordably. It's worth it just to go to an entirely new place, a new part of the world and see, see what people see there. Just have an entirely new view of the world. What's an international city that's still on your bucket list? I really want to go to Jerusalem and I really want to go to um, to Greece. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Favorite U.S. city? New York. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's where the world revolves around. We all will. <laughs> well, these days it's it's a little well, weird, but I still, you know, if you if you love New York, you you love it, and it doesn't really matter. You know, it goes it goes through hard times. I'd like to talk uh, outside of writing. Uh, you have some other ventures, uh, you and your husband and your son. I know I've seen pictures of him helping on on the farm there. They you help. <laughs> Judy Blue's farm in Greenville, New York. You you've had that since 2017. You describe this farm as producing high quality food using sustainable holistic methods. And just by the pictures, you have cows, pigs, chickens, sheep, goats, vegetables. What am I missing? <laughs> we no longer have chickens. Oh. Um, unfortunately, they proved to be uh, no, like we never could really figure out how to protect them from predators. Um, we're in a tough spot for that, just where we are. So um, ultimately, we're, we decided not to not to do that, at least for for now, until we figure out, <laughs> figure out how that works. But yeah, right at the moment, we have we have cattle, sheep, and pigs. Nice. You also run, and your husband uh, run Two Hands Cafe. Yeah, it's mostly him, but yeah. Is it mostly <laughs> I, him? Yes. I help. What, yeah. Uh, Describe this cafe for me. Um, so they are all day restaurants with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's an all day menu. Uh, my husband is Australian. I didn't meet him when I lived there. I met him years later in New York. Interesting how it worked out. He is Australian and um, he grew up there, at, you know, as most people do there with a lot of really fresh, healthy avocado toast and eggs and, um, like delicious big salads and um, just really like well-raised meat, like really hearty food, but that's also very fresh and healthy. And they're very focused on coffee, really good coffee. Um, so he kind of brought that concept to New York and opened the first cafe in 2014 with a partner. And then since then they've opened three more restaurants in New York, and then one in Austin, Texas this year. Your food taste has changed throughout this process, correct? <laughs> yeah, I've become more conscious of what I'm eating and where it comes from, definitely, yes. obviously now, having the farm. And now that's really important to me, whereas like, you know, when I was in high school, I didn't know, I, that's not something that I ever would have thought of 
at all. Even in college, I've evolved and grown since I've known him, especially. So what I noticed was that you write, you farm, you, there's not a verb, you restaurant, you've got your son. How do you juggle everything? I think that's something that students struggle with is I have all of these different moving parts going with work and school. And obviously you do too. You've got all these moving parts. What ways do you juggle everything? You know, it, it can be tough, especially, well, especially right now with my son, because he's at an age where he's really like wanting to interact so much. It's a little easier. It was a little easier when he was a baby, you know, he could just kind of, you know, they slept, he slept a lot more and he was a baby, but now he really wants to like play a lot. And I want to be present and be there with him and not be like, you know, on my phone or something. Cause I also at the moment I have a copy edit, part-time copy editing job, which is like a few hours every day as well. And I'm, I've got some like ghostwriting jobs that I do on a regular basis and a bit of freelance journalism. That's the hardest part. And at the moment, childcare stuff is just a little wonky because of the pandemic, but um, you know, it's, it's prioritizing what, what needs to get done, like what needs to get done today, uh, what needs to get done this week, what needs to get done this month, um, and moving through things, I think, like, I think I used to be a little more, uh, perfectionistic, um, and, and now, and I think, you know, also it just comes with experience as you do things more, you get a little more comfortable with, with doing them. And you can just say like, okay, yeah, that's good enough. I can move on to the next thing rather than fixating on it and trying to make it perfect. But I think it's good, you know, like kind of the same thing as when I was working all those jobs in New York, it's good to stay in motion. I think like it's, there are times when, you know, especially for writing, you do need stillness and quiet to concentrate. But, um, but I think that a lot of the time, if you try to empty everything else out of your life and just write or just do the one thing, you probably won't be as productive as you would with other things going because then you kind of, you keep, you keep momentum and it depends on different stages of a project. But yeah, at the end of the day, you got to keep moving. You got to keep like, you know, you got to keep making money, <laughs> whatever that might look like. So I've got to, you know, um, as a writer, like it's, it's hard to find yourself in a position where you've got a steady stream of income. So you got to kind of like seek out different jobs and you know different things you can do and um and keep you know keep making money so that you can keep doing what you want to be doing and there are no vacation days on a farm too correct <laughs> that's true <laughs> no vacation days with a two-year-old either <laughs> no there's not i've got one last question before i throw a couple of fun ones at you okay. and i really appreciate um from what I can tell through your Twitter feed, how you like to also give back to the world too. You have certain things that uh, you're passionate about. One of those is you work with the Girls Right Now organization. What are some other ways, you can talk about that as well, but what are you passionate about, about giving back to the world? Well, I think, you know, writing fiction is is really unique and, and special. I mean, a lot, you know, so many things are, but just from my perspective, I love writing fiction because you really are in a position where you can give, give hope. Like I, I hope that through, through um, the Eden books and the other middle grade fiction that I write, that I can just encourage kids and give them hope. And like one of the things that I wanted, I wanted to come across in the Eden books was um, just how how big and wonderful the world is, um, you know, kind of how we've been talking about and that it's, it can be hard, but it's worth it. It's, it's worth, it's worth taking those risks and, and putting yourself out there and seeing what you can find. And as a part to promote the Eden books, the main thing that I did was do school visits. That was um, like an incredibly special part of it for me as well. Obviously it's been a while <laughs> since that's been possible. Um, this year is not, is not very school visit friendly, but, um, but yeah, I love going and, and talking to 
students and encouraging them. I, I try to um, donate my books whenever and wherever I can to schools and libraries um, and donate other books to schools and libraries um, when I can, because yeah, I just, I just think that reading and you know, when I look at my life, reading fiction when I was young made such an enormous impact on me and really like my life wouldn't have been the same had I not had so much exposure to books when I was young. So, um, so I'm passionate about, you know, providing that same opportunities to see the world and imagine bigger and, um, and hope more to, um, to kids and, and young adults and teens. Yeah. You've definitely put ripples out in the world, just so you know. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I, I'd love to, I'd love to do so much more, but, um, you know, but got to just do what you can when you can. And then, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully there will be more opportunities. There will. I got some fun questions for you. When you look back five years from now and you think, oh, 2020, what is one memory that stands out? We have been living back and forth between the city and the farm, but really this whole year we've just been at the farm and we're actually not not going to have an apartment anymore in the city for the time being. So we've mostly been at the farm, but to, um, we came to the farm two day or like the day that they closed indoor dining in New York City. And then my birthday was two days later. So yeah, it just stands mm -hmm. out to me because um, we actually had a couple of friends who came up with us, so it was, it was nice. Um, you know, we had, we had a couple of us here, but it was also just a very strange time to have a birthday. I want to have you rank the following musicals. You have, uh, I saw an interview where you named these musicals and I want you to rank them. One being your favorite. Okay. Sing it in the rain, Fiddler on the Roof, My Fair Lady. Singing in the Rain and My Fair Lady are so close. I guess I, I'd probably have to say My Fair Lady, mm -hmm. then Singing in the Rain, and then Fiddler on the Roof. Favorite movie director? Hitchcock. Hitchcock. Well, that was fast. Yes. Yeah. The birds messed me up when I was a kid. Yes. Well, they will all mess you up. <laughs> <laughs> when you think of high school, what movie pops in your head? This is kind of a weird one. I think this was when I was in high school. Um, being John Malkovich. <laughs> so good. <laughs> <In my head. laughs> Which is still one of my favorite movies, but I think I watched it when I was in high school and, um, and just loved it. It's so bizarre and, and it's great. So, bizarre. <laughs> so strange. When you think of music you listened to in high school, what music were you listening to? Uh, I was listening to like hip hop, like Nelly. And um, <laughs> what else? Like Ja Rule and stuff. Yeah, stuff like that. We listened when I was in high school. Please tell me you had a band aid underneath your eye. Like I night at some point. Oh, I used to love Avril Lavigne. My friends and I dress. My friends and I used to dress up like her and wear um, ties with our tank tops. Probably nobody at Blackman knows what that means or who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you do. <laughs> I bet they do. Hey, Green Day's still around. Like they're still living Green Day. Yeah. What's the most boring thing about you? I kind of feel like I'm generally pretty boring, but <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess um, I guess like at the moment, my day to day life is pretty boring. <laughs> it's just like you know, like toddler computer and um and like cows <laughs> cows <laughs> yeah. what's the most new york thing about you right now the most new york thing meaning like the city or the state the state or northern thing if you would like to say not this is like completely not a new york thing but it is a northern thing my husband loves which he he just when he moved to america he he decided that he was gonna love all the boston teams so because i never really was like that that much of a sports fan before i've become a boston fan for everything now too so that's pretty that's pretty northern it's definitely not new york though 
Uh, yeah, I can't think of anything. Yeah. I guess I guess one New York thing, New York City thing, I have become a little bit of a coffee snob, which mm. <laughs> I wouldn't have expected because I used to not even I didn't even drink coffee and then when I did I used to drink it with like you know six sugar packets in it so yeah so that's that's a New York thing I guess what's the uh, most Tennessee thing about you still or has all the Tennessee worn off of you no it hasn't no um most Tennessee thing well I I actually didn't like country music until I left Tennessee but now I love it. Once I got to LA, I realized like, oh, I really miss country music. <laughs> I realized I would just hear it all the time, even though I wasn't actually listening to it. Um, so that's that's maybe the most Tennessee thing. I also have like, you know, I have a pickup truck now with like um, John Deere, um, like steering wheel cover and yeah, some of, that, some of that stuff that I never had when I was in Tennessee. Nice. What are you currently reading? I just started a new book by Otessa Moshfeg. Do you know her? Mm -hmm. She is I like, she's such a strange writer, but I love her so much for some reason. I'm just, I'm just mesmerized by her writing. So I'm reading her book that came out this year, which is called Death in Her Hands. And I'm listening to um, a young adult book. I'm always listening on Audible. I'm always listening to books because it's a lot more feasible with um, a toddler <laughs> while I'm running yes. around after him. I'll have something going or if I'm taking him for a walk. I also listen to books if I'm like out doing chores with the animals so, because then I can multitask. So I'm listening to the new book by Karen McManus, um, who wrote, uh, I'm blanking now, but this one is called The Cousins. Nice. She wrote like a, a young adult mystery that was like a super bestseller that was really good. And now I'm blanking. It's like The Breakfast Club, but, but a murder mystery. Ooh. But I'm blanking on what it's called. Anyway. Audiobooks changed my life too. Same. Yeah. yeah. Or Absolutely. in the car when you're driving, it's just like, it's like, wow, now I can read and do other things at this same time. Yes. My last question is, as President Jed Bartlett from the West Wing would say, what's next? More, we're, we're growing the farm. So we just got a bunch of new pigs. We're doing the pigs. Um, yeah, we're like working on the, the, we actually started a new um, company through our farm where we're, um, we're selling to individuals, but we're also selling to my husband's restaurants and hopefully other restaurants as well. For the first time this year, I have started writing short stories like for adults, which I've never done before, but, um, but it's been great. I just, you know, I felt like, I felt like I needed, I don't know. I just felt like I wanted to grow creatively and I was drawn toward it. So I did a I did a master class with Joyce Carol Oates and then I just just started writing some short stories and I've got a great writers group that um, I've had an opportunity to you know workshop. I'm gonna start doing that along with um, continuing to write middle grade. I've got a new middle grade book which I'm like about to start querying. More writing, more farming. Um, I've, I'm actually, I've got a baby on the way <laughs> in May. Oh, nice, congrats. Um, that's awesome. So yeah, so that's what's next. Well, for the audience, check out Eden's Wish and Eden's Escape by M. Tara Crowell. Also check out Two Hands Cafe, <laughs> Judy Blue's Farm, and there's tons of different things going on. Um, M. Tara Crowell, thank you so much for your time here with Blackman High. And uh, any last words for our audience? Uh, thank you, Brian, and thank you for um, doing so much research and putting so much thought into those questions. That was great. It was really fun. Uh, everyone, good luck getting through the rest of this pandemic. I'm sure it's hard in high school, but it'll end. Things will be so much better. And um, for all of you going to college, good luck. Enjoy it and take, the, take all the good and forget about the bad stuff.